After the Battle of Edge Hill, sharp differences emerged within the parliamentary camp. For some, it reinforced the idea, this uh, inconclusive result, re reinforced the idea that the king could only be negotiated from a position of strength, and therefore what was necessary was to pursue the war with renewed uh, energy. However, other people drew the opposite conclusion, that uh, this war, which they thought, uh, well, all of them, I think, thought it would be over quickly, over by Christmas, as they say. When they saw that it was not the case, then they thought, well, it's, this is going to be a long war. It's going to affect trade. It's going to affect our profits. It will be long and costly. And in the last analysis, because of the movement of the masses, it could ultimately threaten the whole of the existing social order. And this was the idea, really speaking, that was on the minds of all of them, both the royalists and uh, particularly the moderate uh, Presbyterian uh, parliamentarians. This was the decisive element, fear of the masses. Now, I've got before me here a letter written by a man that uh, I mentioned, I think, last time, Captain John Hotham. The Hothams were one of the big uh, aristocratic families in, in the north, in Yorkshire, that were the, the main resistance points to, to the royalists. Uh, 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 Captain John Hotham, if you remember, was the man that refused the king entry into the, into the town of Hull when he went to collect the... Uh, the weapons. Nevertheless, he was having second thoughts already, particularly after what he saw in Bradford, the uprising which I mentioned last time. And he secretly entered into correspondence with the Royalist Earl of Newcastle, to whom he sent a letter dated the 9th of January 1643. I'll just quote one, ex one short extract, there's a lot more they could quote. Very revealing letter. And he wrote the following, I fear much that if the honourable endeavours of such a powerful man as yourself do not take place for a happy peace, in other words, you don't make peace soon, the, necess the necessitous people, the poor people, that is, the necessitous people of the whole kingdom will presently rise in mighty numbers and whatever they pretend for at first, whatever they pretend to support at first, within a while they will set up for themselves to the utter ruin of all the nobility and gentry of the kingdom. These are very striking lines indeed. And indeed, soon after writing these things, the, Hoff, the whole of the Hotham family deserted with arms and baggage to the side of the royal, royalists, judging clearly that the king offered the better security for their class. Of course, this uh, mood led to the creation in London of, of the, what you might call the Peace Party led, I think I mentioned it last time, led by the Earl of Bedford and Denzel Hollis, who'd been a prominent uh, leader up until this point, had been a prominent leader of the parliamentary opposition to the king. And these two and others made a, a peace party which was striving to reach a speedy agreement with the king, I would add, almost on any terms. And this, not, not, not accidentally, this was accompanied in August of 1643 by the outbreak of mass demonstrations, quite big demonstrations, led, mostly led by women calling for peace. I don't think that's an accident. I certainly believe that Hollis and Co. had a hand in this. And this uh, agitation in London, which uh, continued for some time, represented a serious threat. It was a dangerous, uh, a dangerous situation. And indeed, uh, Pym decided, parliamentarians decided, that they had to turn out the army to put these demonstrations out by force. So it was the beginnings of quite a delicate, quite a dangerous situation. And yet, and yet, by the autumn of 1643, a few months later, the tide had turned decisively in Parliament's uh, favour. One of the elements here undoubtedly was the fact that the uh, Gloucester, the town of Gloucester, was besieged by, besieged by the Royalists, who'd run out of ammunition, it seems was relieved by parliamentary forces. So for, for the first time, for a long time, they could slate a, a, a military victory on their side. But that wasn't enough, clearly. It wasn't enough. And Pym now had to consider, he was quite a wily uh, customer, quite a clever manoeuvrer. He decided the first step was to crush the, 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 the peace party. He was uh, the leader, in fact, of the war party. He was 
that faction which wanted to continue to make war on the king. And he received the energetic support, the enthusiastic support of the radicals, of the extreme left wing inside and outside of parliament. And uh, <laughs> this support was not necessarily to his liking. It's a little bit to quote Lenin when Lenin said, we support the reformists as a rope support a hanged man. <clears throat> They were backing him already. And by the way, we should mention at this time, it's significant, for the first time, you get the emergence of the levelers, the extreme left wing of the parliamentarian side of the war, uh, and it represented even in parliament at that time, although only, I think only by one man, I might be wrong, but I think it was only the one man uh, called uh, Martin. Henry Martin, a very attractive character, by the way, a very interesting man, not sufficiently well known. He was a, 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 a member of, of quite a well-to-do family, as some of them were. He was from a, a, well, a wealthy family, but he went over very enthusiastically to the side of the revolution, to the side of the poor. And at the time that we're talking about, he was actually in charge. He was a prominent member of the war party, it goes without saying. He was in charge of uh, requisitions, of expropriating the... Uh, property of uh, enemies of the uh, parliament, which he did with, with great enthusiasm, with great gusto, sending his troops to expropriate the wealthy uh, Catholics and, and royalists uh, all over the country, which of course made him a very suspect character from the standpoint of the, of the possessing classes of the men of money, didn't like that at all, threat to private property, you see. He also made himself distinctly unpopular with the House of Lords by attacking them continually and demanding a reduction of their powers. And therefore, in a sense, Pym was a bit uneasy about taking his next, any step to step up the, the military campaign against the king. He decided that he had to, to, to protect his, his uh, right flank by striking blows against the left wing, which he did. He chose his moment and opportunity and he ditched, he finally got rid of uh, Henry Martin, eliminated him from the House of Commons, from which he was excluded until after the war, as a matter of fact, despite the very important role that he was playing. The, uh, the extreme left wing at that time was actually proposing a general uprising. That's a fact. They even put resolutions and petitions forward. The conditions were present for that, but of course, that's the last thing that a respectable man like him wanted to, uh, to occur. He also was frightened of the masses if it came to that. And therefore he decided in his wisdom that the best way out of his dilemma was to seek a military alliance with Scotland, with the Presbyterians of Scotland, who were also similarly respectable men of property. So he sent uh, his representatives to, uh, to Scotland to negotiate, and naturally the Scots uh, were, were listening, but naturally also uh, their aid didn't come free of charge. It came with a, it attached with a very large bill. And the first demand of the Scots, this is quite traditional of the Scots Presbyterians, was unity in religion, by which they meant that the whole church, the whole religion of all the land, north and south of the border, would in fact be pres Presbyterian. Now, Pym, who was not a Presbyterian, he had been opposed to this. But as the English proverb goes, needs must when the devil drives. He was in a... a a dilemma, and this seemed to be the easiest way out. So, therefore, he he did a deal with the Scots. The, the Scottish people, the Scottish, signed what was known as the Covenant, the National Covenant. And on the 25th of September, 1643, the House of Commons in London, with, with uplifted arms, we are informed, in the Church of St. Margaret's, which you can still visit outside Westminster Abbey, uh, swore to observe it. And in January of the following year, it was just very shortly afterwards, indeed, a mighty army of over 21,000 Scottish soldiers crossed the, crossed the border into England, thus transforming at the stroke the military uh, equation. The balance of forces was radically altered. And by the spring of that year, spring of 1644 rather, three strong armies composed of 50,000 men took the field, preparing to coordinate with the Scots a new offensive against the king. Now, one has to look at the reasons for this alliance with the Scottish Presbyterians. It was, uh, of course, partly, uh, to a large extent, it was a military question, and I've just described 
the numbers are concerned, the large numbers, which transformed the military equation immediately, that's true. But there was also a political element to this, which is often overlooked. You see, the Presbyterians in Scotland and the Presbyterians south of the border in London, to a large extent, they shared the same interests, the same class interests. These were men of property, wealthy people, that were horrified by the uh, upsurge of the, uh, of the people, of the revolutionary elements, and were determined to seize back control. They wanted to, again, they all wanted to do a deal with the king, but they wanted to defeat him first. That was the difference with the peace party. They wanted to inflict a, a military defeat on Charles, such that he'd be forced into uh, an agreement. And part of this, part of the, 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 the you must understand this, as I've explained, the religious question and the political question are closely linked. You can't separate the two. In order to crush the left wing, to crush the levelers, if you like, uh, it was necessary to curb the religious radicals. It was necessary to crush them too. And the way to do that was to introduce Presbyterianism, which, of course, it was a very strict uh, kind of regime, which did not admit uh, religious tolerance. You know, the, the, the Presbyterians had to control everything. The presbyters, which is a word for priest in, in effect, later on the, the radicals said that a presbyter is just another word for a priest, which is true. And therefore this was a blow against the sectaries, against the radical, the religious radicals, and also against the levelers and so on. Who, by the way, at this time were beginning to get support, a lot of support, not just in London and other areas, but also in the army itself. I'll deal with that a little bit uh, later. Now, I should add another point here. The uh, parliamentarians look, look to the Scots to support, and therefore the king, in, in the, you know, ev every action has an equal and opposite reaction, he turned to Ireland. Now, this is something he'd been accused of all along by Parliament, that he wanted to introduce an Irish Catholic army into English soil. He, he and the Queen denied this, of course. But then, of course, he did just that, didn't he? He did just that. He did a deal with Irish rebels, and therefore a, a, an Irish Catholic army promised to stage a landing in Scotland, in Argyllshire, and Argyllshire, Argyllshire rather, to support a, 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 a rising of the Highland clans organized by the Earl of Montrose, who played a key role later, as we shall see. So in November of the same year, Irish troops began to arrive in England from Munster and Leinster and were sent to defend Chester. Chester. Now, this was uh, not a clever move, not such a clever move on Charles's part as he'd hoped. The immediate effect was, was a, re a rebellion in his own ranks. His own officers uh, were appalled at this. They weren't in favor of a deal with the, the papists and the, the Catholics. And in fact, many of the lords who fled to Oxford now returned uh, as, as quick as possible to, to London in horror at this latest uh, development. But apart from the Scottish alliance, which uh, was, was an important element, yes, there was another even more important. And that was the creation of a new army, a new kind of army. Mainly the work of Oliver Cromwell, who now begin, begins to play uh, an absolutely key role, which he hadn't done so far. Cromwell and the other radical Puritans Firmly rejected, of course, the defeatism of, uh, of Bedford and Halls and the pursuit of price, uh, peace at any price. But Cromwell concluded the following. That in order to defeat the king, you need a new army. An army, as he said, are composed of godly men. He concluded that, uh, that the old army, the, the army, was not fit for purpose. I should explain, by the way, that in the early days, that both the king's army and the parliament's army were composed of volunteers. Yes, that was in the early months. But of course, very soon the, the volunteers dried up and people realized the horrors of war. But they were a bit reluctant to, uh, to participate. And therefore, they resorted to, to pressing people, uh, forcible conscription. This again wasn't, wasn't very satisfactory. And the type of men that were recruited weren't very satisfactory. They weren't fighting in a voluntary sense, they were not convinced in many instances, or they were just fighting maybe for plunder and things like that. And Cromwell realized that what was necessary was, first of all, a strong cavalry force. I've already stated the main weakness of the parliamentary forces was the, the, the weakness of the cavalry, which is 
you know, the sons and daughters of the sons of the rich rather had horses. Uh, the parliamentarians mainly didn't. They were perhaps farmers' boys, and so they didn't fight in the same way. By the way, the same phenomenon existed, if you look at history, in the, uh, in the American Civil War, uh, where in the early days, the Southern, the Confederates had a superior, superior cavalry, and that showed in the first instance, so much so that, Mark, that, uh, that uh, Engels thought that the South was going to win. Marx had to correct him, explaining that no, it was the, the North because of its industrial weight and the proletariat and so the industry and its wealth and its huge support, of, of huge reserves of manpower that would win, and he was right. The Russian Revolution was a similar thing in the Civil War in Russia. In the early days, the Cossack cavalry played havoc with, with the Red Army until, of course, Trotsky issued the famous slogan, the proletarians to horse, and he created the Red Cavalry, which again, transformed the whole situation. Now, exactly the situation existed now with the, in the English Revolution. Uh, Cromwell understood that in order to defeat uh, Prince, Prince Rupert's cavalry, you needed a different type of uh, cavalry and indeed a different type of, uh, of, of soldier. And therefore, this is the beginning, beginning of what became known as the new model army. Now, this is a very striking and incredible development, unknown in previous history. history the world has never saw, saw anything like this in the past. The new model army. At this stage, it wasn't known by that uh, term. It was known as the Eastern Association because Cromwell's base was mainly in the eastern, eastern Anglia and uh, East Anglia and Cambridge, that uh, that area where he came from. He spent of his own, his own, a lot of his own money, his, his own fortune was spent in arming and equipping the, the, this uh, this force. But you know. If one looks for an historical analogy, you might say, and I think it's not far wrong, you know, to say that the new model army of Cromwell was a kind of combination, to compare it to the Russian Revolution, it was a kind of mixture, a combination of the Soviets, the Bolshevik Party, and the Red Army all rolled into one. Now, you might think that's a far-fetched uh, an analogy. I don't think so. And we will see that it is uh, quite a precise analogy. Now, the uh, Intervention of the Scots and the uh, pressure from the Presbyterians to gain, uh, to, to abolish religious tolerance, inevitably caused uh, friction and hostility and resentment on the part of the, uh, the independents in general. Cromwell itself was, uh, was an independent, this, that group of religious, uh, of religious belief. And in particular, the sectaries, the uh, extreme left wing, which were more and more powerful in the ranks of the army because Cromwell did not mind at all recruiting from the poorer sections of society, the men with no shirts, as they say. And of course, the religious sectors, he didn't care. They didn't care who joined, as long as they were good fighters and they believed in God. They had very strict rules, strict discipline, which wasn't the case in most armed forces in those days, strict discipline. Men were not allowed, soldiers were not allowed to swear, they weren't allowed to blaspheme, they'd have to pay a fine. They weren't allowed to drink or get drunk or anything like that. And they were subjected to quite a severe discipline. But of course, they were inspired by their own revolutionary and religious uh, fervor to conduct uh, what they considered to be war. Now, the Presbyterian Scottish generals, when they met Cromwell, they saw the, the, the troops that he brought to the battlefield, they were quite horrified. They were shocked and alarmed by the, what they saw, these sectaries, these alarming, uh, they were considered to be a bit mad, these mad people running around uh, full, full of religious fervor. They protested to Cromwell about this, but he brushed their, their protest to one side. Uh, quite. They, they accused him that, they, that he was harboring Anabaptists. You know, this is one uh, sect. And uh, he said, "No, no, no! Don't, uh, don't be, don't be nasty! Don't be, don't be like that. Uh, if you knew these guys, you would." He said, "You would respect them. D you would respect them. Did you see them? If you saw them, they are no Anabaptists. They are honest, sober Christians. They expect to be used as men." And he went on. He made a number of points. A marvelous speech. He said, "The state, in choosing men to serve it," he wrote before Mars and Moore takes no notice of these opinions. In other words, what they require is good fighters, and that was shown very soon in one of the decisive battles of the Civil War, the Battle of Marston Moor. Uh, 
Now, the background to that is uh, to do with, again, the north of England, which had been a stronghold of the king's force at the beginning of the war, uh, although it's changed since, uh, somewhat since the uprising in Bradford and so on. But it was, it was held firm by the formidable Earl of Newcastle. Now, he's a man I think I have some respect for, uh, actually. He was a loyal defender of the king, a firm defender of the king. He's also a good military commander with a lot of common sense, unlike Prince uh, Rupert, as we will see. Yes, he held Newcastle quite uh, loyally, but the situation changed with the arrival of the Scottish army. When the Scots crossed the border, that changed everything. And he was obliged to flee from, uh, from uh, Newcastle through Durham to York, which then was besieged, of course, by the parliamentary forces. Now, this placed the king in serious difficulties. If, if York was going to fall, this was going to be a terrific blow. And therefore, he wrote a letter to, uh, to Prince Rupert, a letter with a tone of desperation, which includes the sentence, I quote, If York be lost, I shall esteem my crown a little less. In other words, this, this battle was quite a decisive uh, battle. It was also the biggest and bloodiest battle of the whole civil war. I mean, Huge forces were involved on both sides. It was a very, a very bloody, a very bitter conflict, during which Cromwell himself was wounded in the neck, I think, or in the cheek, I can't remember, in the fighting. During which his, his, his nephew, young chap, lost his life, he was killed. Cromwell wrote a very moving letter, if I had the time I would read it, I recommend you to read it, to his brother-in-law, explaining the death of his, the death of his sons. But Cromwell, despite his wounds, returned to the battlefield and he fought shoulder to shoulder with his troops until victory was assured. This battle was characterized say, by, by desperate, furious fighting. Both sides realized it was a, an important uh, affair. But eventually, the tide turned in favor of the parliamentary forces and Cromwell's role in this was absolutely vital. Particularly since, if you can believe this, the Earl of Manchester was theoretically a superior. He was the second in command. He was in charge of the cavalry. He'd risen quite rapidly in the ranks, but Manchester was supposed to be in charge. And Manchester was one of these guys like Essex. Essex and Manchester were notorious for avoiding battle, for behaving in a cowardly way. And this was no exception. In the middle of the battle, which did, did at some stages, it did appear that the royalists were winning. <clears throat> Uh, the man, Earl of Manchester had abandoned, he fled, the, he fled the field of battle in the most cowardly manner with a lot of his leading officers, leading Cromwell in effect in, in charge, at least of the English troops. And uh, therefore, uh, it all depended on, on, the, on this one man, on Cromwell, who led his troops quite courageously, his cavalry, his new, new formed cavalry, who went into battle singing hymns, singing religious hymns, you know, fired up with religion and revolution. And his troops, of course, had the advantage of discipline that Rupert's cavalry lacked. And having smashed through the uh, cavaliers' ranks, he didn't behave. He didn't do. He didn't make the mistake that uh, Rupert made at the Battle of Edge when he galloped ahead and dissipated his forces, going to, to loot the uh, the baggage uh, train, which is the usual procedure with these guys. Now, this wasn't the case with Cromwell. His troops were disciplined men. They weren't interested in plundering anything. They swung around, they, they were good at maneuvers, they swung, they swung around again and attacked the exposed flank of the Royal Cavalry Infantry, which was instantly uh, ended into panic. It was, it, was, it was crushed. And therefore, by nightfall, it was all over. One incident, actually, Rupert was so, was so confident of victory, at one stage he went and had his supper. I was getting a bit late, a bit peggish. <laughs> He galloped off to me, and he was therefore aroused. He's sitting on the ground comfortably eating, well, more or less comfortably eating his supper. He was informed, sire, that things are, are looking a bit serious here. Had to gallop off, but it was too late. It was too late. To be fair to the Earl of Newcastle, when he arrived on the scene, a little bit late, it's true, he warned uh, Prince Rupert against giving battle because the terrain was not suitable, the weather was bad, and so on and so forth. In point of fact, he was quite right, as subsequent events uh, demonstrated. But Prince Rupert, as usual, being in the arrogant, uh, spoilt uh, brat that he was, was not listening. He was determined to give battle, and uh, 
give battle he did with the result that we know. Uh, the result of this, by the way, was that uh, the king lost one of his uh, most trusted uh, supporters. The Earl of Newcastle was so disgusted at the whole affair that he uh, left for France and uh, never came back. He didn't. Uh, he couldn't forgive the the conduct of Prince Rupert and the fact that the king supported him against uh, against his better judgment. By nightfall, it was all over. It was a serious defeat. It was a, it was a, it was a deadly, mortal blow. So the royalists who lost, uh, I think, about 4,000 dead, 4,000 royalist soldiers had been killed, and a further 1,500 captured, including key officers. The royalists lost all their guns, and many hundreds of weapons and several standards also fell into the hands of the, of the parliamentarians. The Allied forces uh, fared much better, although uh, they had a lot of people wounded, it's true. But no more than 300 were actually killed, and therefore it was a signal victory, particularly for Cromwell and for the Eastern Association. Now, this was a turning point in the war. It uh, secured for Parliament uh, undisputed control of the whole of the north of England, which is a crushing blow, blow for, for Charles. Remember what he said I lose what York, and uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's almost equivalent to losing my throne. He did lose uh, York. York fell, and then Newcastle also fell. Rupert returned south to Oxford to the king with hardly a man left to follow, and he was decimated. And yet, and yet, and yet, you'd think, wouldn't you? You'd think that the parliamentarians would be delighted. You'd think they'd be uh, partying in the streets of London. No such thing. No such thing. The moderates, the Presbyterian moderates in, in the English parliament were far from pleased with this result because it was a victory for Cromwell. Whose, uh, whose outstanding role was underlined by the fact of, by, by comparison with the cowardly behavior of uh, the Earl of Manchester. And here's the problem, here's the central problem, from start to finish, it's the only problem with the Civil War. The unwillingness of the parliamentary generals to fight the king to, to a finish, it's clear. And that, that continued. The Marsden War was not the end of the Civil War by any manner of means. The, Royalist resistance continued on a number of different fronts. But although Parliament had many other opportunities, they still failed to take advantage of it. And the whole thing came to a head in another battle. I haven't got time to deal with it in detail. But this was the Battle of Newbury, where the simmering conflicts between Cromwell and the Earl of Manchester suddenly came to the fore in a most violent uh, altercation. Parliament ordered, had ordered, had ordered uh, Manchester and Cromwell to march against the king with the forces of the Eastern Association. Charles had established his camp at Newbury, uh, where, of course, he was confronted by a far larger parliamentary army. The parliamentarians had a clear superiority, and therefore the result of the Battle of Newbury ought to have been uh, a foregone conclusion. There were two battles, actually, but I won't go into all the details. Now, Cromwell, of course, furiously pressurized uh, Manchester not to waste such a favorable op op opportunity for finishing the war once and for all. But Manchester paid no attention, of course, although his forces were far superior to the king. He rejected Cromwell's advice and uh, declined an engagement. And this led to a, a, furious, uh, a furious row between the two men. I haven't got, I wish I could quote the whole text. I will eventually, when, when perhaps we'll produce a book on this and I'll produce it. But just to give you a flavor of it, Manchester says at one point the following, just get a load of this. He blurted it out actually, but shouldn't have said this, but he did. He said, if the king be beaten, Manchester argued, he will still be the king. But if he beat us, if, if he beat us, he will hang us all for traitors. Now that lets the cat out of the bag, does it not? Does it not? Just compare that to a, 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 a statement made by Cromwell, not at, not at this time, but about that time, when he says, he told his men, if I meet the king in battle, I would fire my pistol at the king as at any other. That's Cromwell's attitude. Now just compare the two. That's the, 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 the compare the two. And then all this is brought out, all this is a blazing row between Cromwell and the Earl of Manchester emerged in a parliamentary debate which took place a little bit uh, 
later, when they both had to defend their points of view. Cromwell attacked Manchester furiously in his speech to the House of Commons. And the House of, uh, the, the, in the House of Lords, of course, they were in different houses, of course, the Earl of Manchester made some very revealing comments. And uh, again, it's a long speech. I haven't got time to quote all of it. But let's, uh, let's see if I can quote a little bit at least. My Lord, if you, will, if you will stick firm to honest men, you shall find yourself at the head of the army, which, which, uh, which shall give birth to king and parliament. This discourse, Manchester warned the House, made the greater impression on me because, listen to this, because I knew the Lieutenant General, that's Cromwell, I knew the Lieutenant General to be a man of very deep designs, very sly in other words, very devious. I knew the Lieutenant General to be a man of very deep designs. And he has even ventured to tell me in private, there's no, <laughs> no, no proof of this, but he said it anyway. He has even ventured to tell me that it would never be well in England till I were Mr. Montague, instead of the Earl of Manchester, till I were Mr. Montague, and there were never a lord or peer in the kingdom. Now, I don't believe that Cromwell ever said those words, but Manchester probably made it up. But these were the words that he wanted to frighten the House of Lords with. That this, this man Cromwell, in other words, is a dangerous revolutionary and a dangerous radical who wants to establish equality throughout the land and the abolition of the House of Lords. Now, here you have it in a nutshell, the whole dilemma of the English Civil War. There's nothing else you need to understand about it. In other words, the wealthy Presbyterians in Parliament, the landowners and capitalists and bankers, were striving for a deal with the king because they saw the monarchy, and they continued to see it actually to the very end, as a bulwark against radical revolutionary changes that posed a threat to private property. That's it in a nutshell. This argument between Cromwell and uh, Manchester expresses the whole dilemma with crystal, crystal clarity. In other words, the, the men of property had no desire to pursue the war to the end because they were far more terrified of the dispossessed masses than they were of royalist reaction. That was the problem. And this central problem had to be overcome one way or another or else the, 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 the civil war, the revolution in England would never be completed, which of course eventually it was. And this was done in a way which we will begin to discuss next time when I will deal in greater detail with the significance and the role of this marvelous new uh, creation, this uh, new model army.